Hi, I'm Dr. Richard Stroud. I'm a veterinary patho pathologist with a very unique calling. I work for the United States Fish and Wildlife Service in the Department of Interior as a veterinary medical examiner for the Division of Law Enforcement uh, for the Fish and Wildlife Service. I have a very unique job and uh, I hope to uh, share with you uh, through the uh, C.L. Davis Foundation uh, series some of the things that I have learned about forensics and uh, in particular forensics of wildlife. I believe it's appropriate to say that what I have done with forensics in wildlife is also very applicable to the forensic area that uh, other pathologists might encounter in a diagnostic lab or even a research lab. Uh, we have seen a, uh, a very sharp rise in interest in the uh, forensics of animals, uh, particularly with some of the television shows that we've seen on TV uh, that emphasize forensics and uh, the science of forensics. And therefore, I think this is appropriate at this time. Perhaps we could uh, uh, pan to the first slide where we can start to understand what forensics are is. Forensics is really a term that just deals with legal matters and we have various uh, types of forensics from medical legal questions answered by the medical examiner to computer forensics to uh, DNA and all types of things that have to do with experts in particular fields that can help a court of law determine uh, the answer to a question. The ones I work with in particular, and this is a team uh, kind of a uh, concept, uh, we all work together because we depend on uh, each other to find answers to particular parts of the problem. I work with the DNA people who can identify tissues of various species of animals. I work with uh, chemical analysis which uh, gives me uh, information on poisons that I find in uh, suspected poisoning cases. I work with bullet ID people who are classical forensic people that work from crime labs and these give me uh, bullet identification uh, matching back to guns, that type of thing. One area of very unique uh, uh, area in, in, our, in our laboratory is morphology and these are people that look at the structure of things and try to identify them back to various species such as hair, fibers, uh, skulls, bones, that type of thing. But of course you cannot uh, get through uh, patho without pathology and I work in a laboratory where I do the cause of death for a number of uh, agencies which submit material from wildlife uh, for cause of death. And these can be uh, anywhere from uh, elk and deer, uh, bears, grizzly bears, down to hummingbirds. So I'm sure that pathology is, of course, the interest of the C.L. Davis Foundation, and I will dwell mostly on things that pertain to the pathologic uh, examination of animals rather than get into the uh, rather large field of other types of forensics. <clears throat> the medical uh, the terminology here, the applied use of uh, medical knowledge, especially pathology for the purpose of law, is the definition of forensic medicine. Forensic science, again, is a rather broad area which can include about any science. Where do we get cases from and where might you expect to find cases come from if you're a pathologist in a, say, a diagnostic lab? For one, they're obvious if they're submitted by legal authorities, the state police, local uh, police, uh, sheriffs, that type of thing, authorities that may be assigned to protect wildlife, such as wildlife conservation officers, and then, of course, there may be humane officers in various areas that could submit material. These would be, of course, animal abuse type cases. We also would see uh, possibly insurance cases in the private area of uh, consultation uh, where somebody had a uh, legal question as it related to insurance payment. 
that needed to be documented. Sometimes it's a malpractice type of thing which would come in. Did, did the doctor treat my uh, pet uh, adequately? And what did it die of? And so therefore uh, a suit may, in, may occur against the veterinarian which a pathologist at a diagnostic laboratory, for instance, would be uh, come involved with. And then, of course, wildlife cases. Now, ours, our laboratory is not the only place where wildlife is submitted for uh, forensic workup because uh, many of the state agencies also uh, send material to state diagnostic labs, uh, universities, uh, that type of thing for analysis uh, for support of uh, cases against uh, poachers. And sometimes you get into rather large cases which may involve environmental contaminants. And these are really fairly complex. Sometimes whole studies are based on, uh, are, are, you're involved in, a, in an entire study which then you must testify as to the results and uh, how the study was conducted, that type of thing, for uh, issuance of uh, fault and that type of thing. Such things are oil spills, um, toxic releases in streams, uh, that type of thing, which end up in litigation. And then sometimes even we have animals involved in human crimes. And I've done several of these that involved human murder cases where uh, a pet animal may have also been uh, killed along with the victim or uh, there has been uh, actually several cases in which animals have killed humans. So before you take a forensic case, uh, some of the things that you might think about. Okay, first, can you process the evidence in a manner consistent with forensic principles? And of course that's hopefully what you'll get a, a kind of an overview idea of through this lecture series. Provide objective, scientifically based evaluations. Remember, the pathologist is an expert trying to discern the truth based on his observations, his training, his knowledge, his interpretation. He does not work for either side in the case. And that's the only way you can stay very objective in uh, your evaluation. Can you preserve the e evidence integrity? This means following a chain of evidence. It also means proper storage and handling, uh, consideration for the defense and its right to go ahead and uh, evaluate the evidence uh, after you've done uh, your work with it. And maintain the confidence regarding the case. We all have a tendency to share things that we see and find very interesting. However, this is a good way to get into uh, some trouble. You never know where this information finally ends up. And of course, in many of the cases that I do, I frequently am asked by the press because uh, animal cases have a seemingly high profile, particularly where uh, endangered species are involved. And then finally, be available to provide a professional quality expert testimony. If you can't, if you don't feel that you can handle this kind of, these kinds of questions, uh, stay away from it. Assign it to somebody else or uh, get, uh, get some training and become competent in the area of forensics. So objectivity, okay, it's not enough uh, to just place a, a diagnostic label on it. I think we have to go farther and uh, reconstruct the events that led to the uh, problem or death of the animal and uh, as best you can based on that available evidence. You can't do, you can, as a expert witness in a professional field, you can have an opinion, but don't uh, mix that up with assumptions or speculation. If you, you're not an advocate for the defense, or the prosecution, <clears throat> but you really are there hired by the court as a seeker of truth. Let the body speak is kind of a saying that uh, I got out of a book by uh, DeMeo. DeMeo is a famous uh, human pathologist, I believe in New York, uh, although there's, there's two of them. There's a father and a son. And I use this every time I look at a, a carcass uh, for a forensic evaluation. I let the body speak, and learning how to understand what that body is saying is really the art of forensic pathology. 
The forensic investigation should include a good field investigation. Unfortunately, in veterinary medicine, very few of us have the opportunity to get in the field and look at the crime scene. For the most part, in human forensics, they have crime scene investigators. And these people are trained to look at the details of the scene. For the most part, I get uh, information coming in from various uh, law enforcement officers that have picked up the animal or are conducting the investigation and I must trust uh, somewhat and also even guide their investigation as to what they should be looking for, what things I would like to know about the body or the carcass that uh, would help me in my uh, examination. Things like where it was found. Was this bird under an electrical power line or was it far from such a uh, structure? Uh, how about road? Is there a road around there? Is this an area that are a lot, have a lot of cougars? What is going on in the farm community as far as uh, is this a sheep raising area or is this perhaps uh, uh, all cropland that may use heavy uh, doses of pesticide at this particular time of the, of the year? So field investigation can uh, uh, be analogous to the crime scene investigation. And uh, again, as I say, I use the agents in the field who are trained to some extent to, for certain things to be looking for in their investigation. Um, there's been a significant increase in their capability of detailing the crime scene and the uh, information that comes from a crime scene as uh, this becomes more of a recognized area of expertise of the Fish and Wildlife Service. The field investigation is based on communication, obviously, and if you don't right, ask the right questions, you'll never get the right answers. So it's up to you, as the veterinary pathologist, to ask the right questions of the uh, uh, people that uh, have originally taken uh, uh, the animal out of the uh, crime scene picture. The objectives of the crime of the forensic pathologi pathologic evaluation are to determine the cause of death. In forensics, in human forensics at least, we talk about the cause, manner, and mechanism. And I'll get into this a little bit later as far as the definition and what each of those factors mean. We're also there to collect and recover and document trace evidence. Trace evidence can mean anything from bullets to uh, fibers, to uh, plant uh, burrs and uh, little small pieces of uh, whatever it might be that some other discipline may want to look at in their evaluation of the evidence. It's up to the pathologist to properly collect that from a body. In our evaluation of the carcass, we also try to, as I say, let the body speak by reconstructing the circumstances that led to the death. We are oftentimes asked for an estimate of the time of death. Seldom do we actually give an indication of the time of death. Uh, the factors involved are quite variable, and while we seek the time of death to place the victim and the suspect together in uh, many of the human cases. Uh, this is uh, a, a very difficult thing to do in most animal cases, mainly because we see stuff that is uh, dead for quite a bit longer than many of the human cases. Okay, so what is the cause of death? It's the disease, injury, or abnormality that alone or in combination is responsible for initiating a sequence of functional disturbances that end in death. Okay, example. If a gunshot wound to an animal cripples it, uh, and if the animal dies in rehab six months later of diseases that uh, anywhere from malnutrition to aspergillosis to some other cause, or even is finally euthanized, uh, the cause of death, as far as legal concern, is gunshot, because that's what initiated the thing. There have been a number of cases in human medicine where people have died years later, and with that, there has been an initiation of a uh, prosecution of the original shooter. Uh, 
So this is nothing new in the uh, legal uh, annals. Okay, now the mechanism of death, we probably have more of a tendency to think of that in uh, uh, veterinary pathology. So we look at structural and functional changes uh, that lead to the uh, animal no longer being able to survive. Things like, you know, bleeding out from a uh, heart laceration uh, would be the cause of death. Uh, so hemorrhage might be put down. But the actual cause of that, cause of death, again back into the for, uh, forensic stage, it would be say a gunshot. The manner of death, well this is one that we don't try to get into too much. Uh, basically in a human situation you can have manner of death include things like homicide where a person intentionally kills uh, another person. You can have uh, suicide, you can have uh, uh, accidental, all these things are of course determined by the jury in a court of law and that's what the expert testimony of the forensic pathologist really amounts to is giving information that somebody else can determine the manner of death for. Um, here are things that uh, might be an example of that. An eagle dies of a pesticide poisoning after eating legally poisoned rats. Okay, this might be called an accident. There may be neglect with it, yes because the uh, person did not place the rat baits in a situation where the rats, according to the directions on the package, would uh, then uh, die underground. And uh, we have had many of these kinds of cases where illegally or improperly used uh, pesticides have caused deaths of endangered species. And the person never meant to and a jury would then be used to determine whether there's an, a, a negligence there that would be a, a liability to him or not. On the other hand, we also have those that directly set poisons out to kill eagles or other species of uh, animals, and these uh, then uh, might be prosecuted under uh, various laws, uh, conservation laws, or even FIFRA. The time of death. Um, even in human uh, forensics, we do not have an accurate way of really pinpointing death. Of course, the closer to the time of death that you find the body and make measurements of, of things like body temperature, rigor, those type of uh, measurements, uh, the better off you are as far as uh, time, putting the time back but there, to the proper time of actual death. On the other hand, the further out you go, if it gets out into weeks or whatever, then the time of death becomes very subjective. Things that have been used with humans, of course, include body temperature, rigor, vitreous humor of the eyes, potassium levels in there, uh, entomology studies, and this is another thing that I will touch on, uh, and taphonomy, that is the weathering of bone. We see these things uh, used in humans, but a lot of the parameters which give us uh, information in animals have not been worked out. For instance, does a rigor of a wolf or an eagle the same sequence and time and duration as rigor in a human body? Um, this, this stuff has not been worked out except for some of the big game species, but then even in that, there are a lot of factors that may change that. Forensic entomology is a uh, forensic science unto itself and has developed in recent years quite nicely with experimental studies both on human corpses and pig corpses at multiple places throughout the country to give different uh, climate and uh, uh, environmental uh, kinds of circumstances. I have used uh, forensic entomology on a number of cases to uh, time the uh, uh, time of death and these are usually uh, animals which uh, uh, have a good uh, mass of maggots or uh, uh, insects which then invade after maggots. Remember that a dead carcass is an ecosystem waiting to happen and that's what the forensic entomologists do they time uh, through the development of the various larva stages and this is done using uh, 
temperature and humidity data which may be locally obtained to uh, try to backdate uh, to a time of death. However, in the real world of uh, animals out there in the wild, uh, we have very highly variable environmental conditions. We have alternating exposure to sun and shade. For instance, I had a wolf one time, which the front half of the wolf looked very decomposed, nothing more than tissue hanging on bones and a, bag, and a large maggot mass. The back end of the wolf, however, was fairly well preserved, uh, mummified in fact almost, and uh, was really quite uh, workable. So you know that the front half did not die at the same time, or at a different time than the back half. So uh, there are different rates of uh, decomposition that you have to take into account. Once maggots or insects get into it, it is, uh, or even scavenger animals, uh, the decomposition uh, factors increase substantially. Things in the water, uh, surprisingly, uh, things in cold water, particularly at the bottom where you have anaero uh, ana anaerobic mud, uh, can uh, stay there for many, many uh, weeks without showing appreciable decomposition. I had a deer one time that was uh, uh, weighted down in some uh, muck and mud which was uh, presumed to be uh, anaerobic and it had been there uh, almost four months uh, when it was found and retrieved and uh, I was asked to look at it and uh, it looked almost like it was good enough to uh, bone out and eat. Uh, just because the anaerobic conditions uh, stop the decomposition and the cold water also. Dry heat will mummify uh, and preserve things quite well also. Activity prior to death, animals that have been run and, and uh, are chased uh, before being shot or perhaps they've been wounded and uh, run before they die. Uh, this will oftentimes change the uh, stages of rigor and may also increase the rapidity of the decomposition because the body temperatures are elevated. Species and size. Some species seem to go pretty quickly. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a uh, enzyme's characteristic of their uh, uh, tissues or if it is uh, some other uh, reason. Uh, size considerations, things that are smaller obviously cool out better and quicker and that may give a better condition. How the animal is transported. Rigor is easily lost when you pack an animal out and start moving it uh, after it's dead uh, just by the mechanics of moving uh, the, uh, the tissues. Uh, they will lose their rigor. Uh, maggot infestation, obviously maggots secrete uh, proteolytic enzymes which uh, accelerate the uh, decomposition uh, significantly. Um, animals that have, for instance, gunshot wounds that have an open avenue for fly eggs and maggots to go in will give uh, very rapid decomposition right within that gunshot wound area, whereas the rest of the carcass may be really quite uh, well preserved. And then systemic disease, uh, such uh, temperature elevating diseases as you know, viruses, that type of thing will also accelerate uh, decomposition. Now in my area of uh, pathology, nothing is too decomposed to examine in a forensic case and you should see some of the stuff I get. I'm sure that most diagnostic pathologists at a uh, uh, state diagnostic lab would uh, say uh, forget it, but I'm still obligated under forensic cases to go ahead and deal with it. Sometimes I even just get skeletal remains and be, be surprised at what you can determine from skeletal remains uh, about cause of death. You can uh, discern trauma, sometimes bullet wounds, uh, that type of thing are obvious on uh, skeletal remains. Um, other times uh, you may have uh, animals that have been scavenged significantly and uh, this is a poisoned uh, uh, coyote and uh, I take the tissues from that and uh, 
there's still uh, traces of pesticide that was used to poison the animal um, on this one. Sometimes, however, uh, particularly the organophosphate and carbamate pesticides decompose equally uh, with the material and you do lose it after a period of time. So what was a nice poisoning case uh, held too long or decomposed too far uh, soon becomes a case you can't prove as uh, in a, anything and it turns out as a uh, uh, undetermined. So let the body speak. Here's an example. Here was a wolf, or the remains of a wolf, I should say, uh, that I received. And as you can see, this is not exactly what you'd call fresh. I uh, did not take any histo samples from this animal. Uh, obviously, uh, it's beyond that. But I was able to determine this. Number one, the skull had two 9 millimeter bullets. Uh, that have passed into it and the remains of the bullets were, were recovered. Now why would some uh, wolf, a wild wolf, uh, let a uh, person get close enough to shoot it in the head with a 9 millimeter pistol? Well, took more searching. Here are the 9 millimeter uh, bullet wounds here in the head, but if I looked all through the bones and took everything apart, I found a uh, what would be either a 22 or a small caliber uh, centerfire rifle bullet through the scapula, which obviously uh, would then have uh, led to the incapacitation of the animal where somebody could come up and finish it off. So the story is, is yes, this animal was shot. It was probably shot at a distance, wounded, and uh, the animal was finished off with a 9 millimeter pistol. So these are the types of stories one tends to get into. Trace, evident, trace evidence is anything that uh, you pull off of that carcass that some other uh, forensic scientists might use. For instance, bullets, bullet fragments, or pellets are trace evidence. Burrs, plants, parts, that type of thing, which may, in some circumstances, give you a clue of where this animal had been. I had a wolf that was found of all places in the red light district of El Paso, Texas. Well, there's no wolves that we knew of that were anywhere south of, say, Wyoming. And uh, yet this was supposed to have been claimed as picked up by the roadside, hit by a car. And uh, when I looked at it, I realized that, well, OK, according to the history, this was supposed to have been hit and picked up fresh dead. Well, there was already maggots on it, which uh, told me that, yeah, this was at least 24 or maybe more hours old, though I wasn't an entomologist. I could have found that out. But I also noticed that there was a bunch of burrs and uh, plant, plant parts on it. And I combed these out of the hair coat, sent them to uh, the university and, uh, where the plant uh, identification people told me, yeah, these are all species from Colorado. So somebody had taken this wolf hit it or killed it, uh, it was hit by a car, and uh, put it in the back of their pickup. And by the time they got to Texas, it probably stunk so bad they decided maybe I better get rid of this thing, and so they threw it out on the road. So that is kind of how you use these other things to tell the story. Items in the gastrointestinal tract, of course, are very important for such things as poisoning cases. But not only do we want to find out if there are poisons in them, but we also want to find out what it was that it ate. So things like hair and bone fragments, or in the case of fish, various types of fish skulls or otoliths may be important in tracking down where the poison came from. So those become trace ev evidence. So hair samples, tissue samples sometimes uh, are uh, considered uh, uh, as trace evidence, even though you may save an entire kidney for, for uh, toxicology, uh, that still comes under the uh, aspect of trace evidence coming from a carcass. And any kind of chemical residue that one might have on the skin or fur, uh, that might also be trace evidence. And of course, insects, if one wants to go ahead and try to determine uh, time of death through entomology. So what do we do with this trace evidence? Uh, here's an example of uh, trace evidence. Uh, I'll, the little green thing next to there is a portion of a bullet 
called a Nosler ballistic tip bullet. It's just the stem of the bullet, of uh, the pointed part of the bullet, and it, it uh, was found in a wolf carcass. Um, as you can see, it's uh, very small, and this had a small stamped uh, letter on the end of it, which, going back to the Nosler company, gives you a, uh, a code for uh, a certain uh, batch number or uh, otherwise identifiable group. The small piece of uh, material then was traced back to a certain batch of bullets and uh, just so happens that the suspect had a, a receipt for um, those bullets or that type of bullet that came from that kind of a batch. So oftentimes it's a very small thing which causes you to obtain uh, a conviction. Uh, here again is another example of trace evidence. This is from uh, pieces of muskrat from the crop of an eagle. And uh, the obvious thing here when I started looking at this is, is there was no skin on any of the muskrats. These eagles had been feeding on muskrats and were poisoned with carbofuran. Um, this led me to look closely at some of the feet which had obvious cut wound, cut, cuts around them where the animal had been skinned out. So these were skinned muskrat carcasses that had been uh, placed out for the eagles uh, and, baited and saturated with carbofuran which killed some 20 eagles. So this led us next to who had muskrat carcasses in the area and finally to the person who uh, put these out for poisoning eagles. So examination of trace evidence may be done by specialists, it may be done by you, but even so these become separate parts of the whole or the original evidence. So subsamples must have a chain of custody or a chain of evidence just as original evidence samples. Um, when you send material out, uh, whether it be for chemical analysis or perhaps a bullet to a uh, bullet examiner or something like that, you want to make sure that the people that are going to be examining it are certified or are otherwise uh, experienced in uh, uh, acceptable protocols for handling evidence, storing evidence, and processing that particular type of evidence because unfortunately your testimony is only as good as the uh, results you get from the chemist or other expert uh, and the evidence handling that they do is also a weak point in the chain. So look at that when you are uh, having material processed by somebody uh, outside uh, for instance, if you take something to the university to have a local expert look at something, uh, be sure that he recognizes the proper way to uh, transfer evidence, store evidence, that type of thing. An analysis of a laboratory is subject to the same potential for court subpoena. Don't surprise them someday and say, hey, guess what, this thing's going to court. Tell them before they process the material that indeed he could be subpoenaed and could be part of this court case before uh, you ask him to do something, uh, for instance, identify the material or otherwise uh, process the evidence. Samples that are altered or destroyed in analysis must be t uh, taken in duplicate to provide defense with sample for their own analysis. For instance, if you have a quantity of stomach contents that you suspect as being uh, uh, contain, or containing a, a poisonous substance like carbofuran, um, the analysis will destroy that sample that you give to the chemist. If uh, you follow the proper protocols here, you need to make two samples, split the sample, one for the defense, which may never get uh, analyzed, and the other for the chemist that is going to uh, go ahead and uh, analyze it for carbofuran. This uh, provides that uh, 
equal opportunity under the law type of a uh, uh, case. I have yet to be asked for duplicate samples, although I have had material that I've examined uh, go in whole, for instance, uh, parts of carcasses and that type of thing, to other pathologists or other, quote, experts to examine and to see if they could determine whether or not my analysis was faulty. So the defense has that right and you have to respect that and preserve the integrity of the material as best you can. For instance, here, this demonstrates both a sample A and sample B uh, held under a, a chain of custody. Uh, the the uh, material stays together. Your analysis is done on A or B, makes no difference, and the rest of it is held for the defense. Okay, we use uh, uh, evidence tape. This is available uh, throughout the uh, forensic uh, community, uh, which is uh, tape that cannot be tampered with uh, to seal all packages. And then you need to go ahead and initial uh, any kind of a seal so that the integrity of that um, sample goes to the uh, next uh, analysis and therefore can be um, assured that it's uh, been handled properly and that you transferred it uh, properly. Okay, I always use a separate uh, identifying uh, number for the lab. For instance, if I take a bullet from a wolf that uh, came in as lab one of a particular case, then the bullet becomes lab 1A. This always associates it back, and I describe it as bullet from lab 1A or bullet from wolf lab 1A or something like that, so that there's no mistake in the uh, origin of it. I photograph it in situ if possible, and this is part of the forensic requirement to be able to sponsor or document uh, the origin of any kind of evidence that evolves from a uh, case. Uh, if you can't document it, uh, the likelihood of getting it uh, thrown out of court is very good uh, by the defense. So if you don't say and have a good uh, ability to say, yeah, this is the bullet that I took out of this animal, um, then uh, there's always the question that will be raised, well, was there a possible mix-up with this bullet that you took out of the animal and another bullet that my client had, and uh, therefore the jury has doubt? Make sure the analysis is done using court-acceptable techniques and evidence handling procedures. I've kind of tried to stress this uh, over uh, several of these slides. We have what's called the Fry hearings, and if new methodology is used in a situation that, say, a, a specific type of analysis, if a new methodology or a methodology that's uh, not accepted within the science is used, then the uh, defense lawyer may call for what's, called, what, what's known as a Fry hearing. And a Fry hearing is kind of a separate little trial type of thing to try the method that was used. It's always better to have somebody do the analysis using tried and true methodology that's well published and well accepted in any kind of a uh, field of endeavor. Uh, I actually had a, a defense lawyer in a case that I testified in uh, try to uh, ask for a Fry hearing because veterinary forensics is a, quote, new field with new, uh, new techniques, et cetera, et cetera. And this was uh, not recognized, i.e., like human forensic uh, medical examiner work. And he was trying to uh, get a fry hearing to see if veterinary medicine actually had application in the uh, forensic field. Uh, the judge didn't buy that at all. Uh, but at least it was a try. Uh, that's the only time I've run across that because we've always used standard protocols for all uh, analysis that we have done. 
When your report depends on the report of another, uh, be sure that it's referenced within your report. For instance, uh, referring back to, let's say, the finding of carbofuran in the gut contents of a poisoned animal, uh, that report then, a copy of that goes with your report and is a, uh, referenced in it as a standalone document. Photographing evidence, uh, very important for the pathologist. Uh, traditionally, film was always used. Uh, acceptable now is digital, and we see more and more of the forensic work being done with digital work, or with digital cameras. And as long as the CDs are, are locked, uh, they will work with the same uh, efficiency as a uh, film. Uh, for instance, everything that I see that's significant, I take a picture of to document. Then when I come to the time of court, I have the evidence of uh, right there uh, in my radiographs, in my pictures, and I can again, like documenting here, this bullet came from this spot in the lung, here it is on the x-ray, and here's the picture of me uh, taking a picture of uh, the material or whatever. And this is, uh, of course, a picture is worth a thousand words and uh, makes it very easy for uh, the uh, uh, jury to understand that. So films are fine. Uh, digital images, as long as we lock them, are now uh, court acceptable. Radiographs are evidence under themselves, and radiographs should be kept uh, as evidence uh, under lock and key. Uh, if you go to court with a radiograph, I think it's uh, very uh, appropriate to go ahead and take pictures of radiographs and uh, use the uh, print picture uh, rather than trying to set up a view box to show the jury. So uh, that's what I do. Now here's uh, all photos must have case and evidence identification incorporated directly in the photo. Uh, this is a, a very important aspect of it so that there can be no doubt that, yes, at the time I took a picture of this skull with these bullets and they indeed have uh, a label in the radiograph as well as, here's another example, here's a picture of an arrow wound in the uh, skin and here is the uh, ruler with the case number and the evidence item uh, clearly visible within the uh, photograph. I've talked about the Fry uh, hearings and can be uh, uh, brought up by any defense attorney and uh, therefore it's acceptable, it, uh, I'll reiterate that it, uh, you should be using uh, well accepted protocols uh, within the scientific discipline represented. If it's uh, chemistry particularly, some chemists like to get real, real creative with their analysis and uh, this is asking for trouble uh, when it comes to court. Be sure that the chemistry or the uh, analysis that's being done, that they have a, uh, a way that they keep track of all their instrumentation and calibration of the instruments, uh, which can be demanded upon uh, uh, or on the court uh, subpoena. Also, be sure to run controls with standard samples. If you don't have your uh, uh, analytical laboratories doing this, why, they're not running a very appropriate shop. Uh, laboratories, I think most veterinary uh, diagnostic labs that are certified uh, as, uh, by the uh, Association of Veterinary Diagnosticians, uh, this is definite advantage because it's, it's a point that assures quality control within the analysis. Uh, forensic necropsy protocols. Okay, history. Don't start without it. And this again will point you uh, hopefully down the right trail, but sometimes will give you a real false uh, rabbit trail to follow. Identification. I always uh, photograph the evidence as I expose or unwrap it so that I have a view of the intact piece of evidence, whether it be an eagle carcass or a wolf carcass or whatever it may be. 
Uh, that way I can describe it and it has its uh, uh, number and its identification uh, right on it. This is then I can say, well, I started, here's what I uh, originally uh, looked at. Of course, as we take an animal apart, it looks a lot different when we get through with it. I always radiograph everything. I have found that a lot of times bullets or pellets and stuff that uh, would not be in the appropriate place, uh, these may or may not be cause of death or they may not be related to the case, but they are there and therefore need to be uh, looked for. A forensic necropsy report. Okay, well, it's not really that much different than a regular uh, pathology report as we go down through uh, examination of external surfaces and internal uh, examination of organs, that type of thing. Uh, photograph and describe lesions. Usually in a gunshot case, I go through and document first the anatomical pathway of the bullet going through. And therefore, it's uh, important to uh, demonstrate that with pictures and that type of thing. Uh, I collect the trace evidence and, of course, the record what exactly the trace evidence is and where it came from, and that's a little bit different. Uh, analytical findings, again, I've already mentioned putting that back in from uh, uh, the other analysis, uh, analytical uh, uh, labs that have worked on the case. And I uh, then list the significant findings, not necessarily the causes of death, but the findings, and finally uh, come into an opinion as to the cause of death, and that would be uh, uh, appropriate because you're acting as an expert witness, and an expert witness is different than a, uh, a witness of fact, and I'll cover that a little bit here. Okay, uh, do not give out the reports to anybody other than the submitter or his legal counsel. This is a good way to get into real good trouble. Write report for the court. Uh, that means sometimes using plain language to describe what you're uh, trying to portray. And finally, discovery. Discovery is that process by which the defense can uh, ask for all your notes, all your photographs, all of your digital images, all of your uh, materials uh, that pertain to emails and or telephone calls uh, pertaining to the case. Therefore, uh, if you don't want it brought in under a discovery to a courtroom, don't write it down. Uh, it, it is available uh, to the court and make sure that your report and any other communications that have to do with this are consistent throughout because these lawyers, they will look through this material and they will look for inconsistencies. If you say in your report that you looked at something and it's not in your notes, guess what? You will be asked about it in the, uh, uh, during your testimony. Okay, the courtroom, kind of a scary place for most of us. Uh, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but I look at it mostly as a classroom teaching opportunity. That kind of helps me uh, realize what my function is, and that's to portray what I saw, and I do not get involved in, my, in the concern for who wins or loses the case. I'm there for the court, to try to make a uh, honest and uh, accurate uh, decision. So therefore, I start at the necropsy table with trial preparation. Anticipate how you might want to show a jury of what you found. You know, has this animal really been shot with an arrow or has it been shot with a bullet? Demonstrate maybe with photographs the differences between bullet wounds and, and, and uh, arrow wounds and then using x-rays or whatever. Uh, trial uh, can also, uh, you must record negative stuff as well as positive and be able to say that. Uh, anticipate the opposite side's explanation of it. In other words, if the history says, oh yeah, the guy is uh, denying that he was uh, uh, putting out poison baits, well, okay, he's going to say, yeah, this animal, these animals were killed by lightning or, uh, or some other 
thing. Well, then put down that there's no evidence of lightning or electrical contact with a power line, that type of thing. Um, establish with a lawyer what you can and cannot say. They will want you to say a lot more than you may be willing to say, believe me. And uh, so you have to kind of rein in the uh, uh, presenting lawyer. A lot of times they, your whole case may de depend on what your testimony may be as to the cause of death and therefore they build from there. If you can't determine the cause of death for sure, they need to know that and they need to know that you're not going to say, yeah, I'm 100% positive that the cause of death is such and such when you can't really show that because, say, the carcass is uh, you know, too autolytic and, and decomposed to, to really rule out some other things. You need to educate your attorney sometimes on uh, what the science of uh, pathology might tell. Make sure your written report is consistent. I already touched on this with the co uh, concept of discovery and use uh, professional quality visual aids. Uh, I, we, we do at the lab have the advantage of having a very professional uh, way to do this. And then, of course, provide uh, an updated CV. I always keep track of all the uh, different types of cases I've done, all the different wolves, so that I can say when somebody asks me, well, how many wolves have you done, Dr. Stroud? And I say, well, I've done a hundred and some odd number, whatever it is right now. I think it's 128. And uh, that gives me credibility right there with the jury. Now, if I've never done a wolf, and the case is involving a wolf, they're going to make a big deal about that. But, hey, I've done lots of dogs, too, so therefore, you know, that's going to do it. So we've covered the rights of the defense, that is, discovery and the evidence. And here's the scary part, the courtroom. You are a witness, an expert witness. It's different than a witness of fact. And the judge will determine whether you are an expert, not the defense lawyer. So don't let them get you rattled by their request to say, yeah, I, I don't think this guy knows what he's talking about as far as wildlife pathology or any other kind of pathology, and therefore he should not be uh, listened to as an expert witness. The judge will determine that, but it's remember, it's the jury that determines your credibility. So how you present to the jury is the credibility part. Okay, as an expert witness, the difference here is is that you can uh, have an opinion from a witness of fact, and that's based on your training, your education, uh, your experience uh, with pathologic uh, matters pertaining to animals. And finally, uh, in the next uh, series, we'll try to cover some of the things like gunshot, trauma, poisonings, and some of these things, which are, uh, by their nature, uh, tend to be uh, forensic cases. So where do I learn about all this stuff? Well, basically, I went to human forensic uh, seminars. One of them, uh, good ones, given by the AFIP on a yearly basis. Another one is given by uh, St. Louis School of Medicine, which uh, you can sign up and go. They're week-long short courses. There's a, a lot of continuing education, all, of course, pointed towards human forensics. But uh, there are starting to be a few things available. There's a lot of textbooks and uh, even websites available in human forensics. There's a few things starting in wildlife forensics. Uh, if you have that interest, there will be a book on veterinary forensics uh, soon to come. And uh, that's basically uh, kind of what I have to say. I thank you for your attention. And uh, again, I would like to thank the, the C.L. Davis Foundation for providing this opportunity. For the pathologist who is uh, working in the area of forensics, gunshot wounds is obviously going to be one of the uh, more commonly encountered uh, types of forensic examinations uh, that he may come across or be asked to perform. Uh, gunshot wounds, of course, uh, are often associated with wildlife, but they may also be uh, 
included in uh, pet deaths, uh, sometimes homicides that involve humans. Uh, the pets will also uh, be uh, gunshot. Sometimes we get them with uh, uh, defense against attacks by uh, uh, domestic animals such as dogs. And so gunshot wound, <clears throat> what can we learn from a gunshot uh, depends somewhat on what we know about gunshot. The science of wound ballistics is really the study of the pathologic effects of a projectile passing through a body. Uh, there's actually a society of wound ballistics uh, where these people are uh, experts primarily in, uh, of course, human uh, cases, but they become experts in uh, answering questions as to uh, gunshot injuries in uh, criminal cases. The science of ballistics, not to be confused with wound ballistics, is really more the study of the factors affecting the travel of a projectile to the target. Now, uh, don't claim to be a ballistics expert if you are a pathologist who has an interest in wound ballistics. Uh, these people, uh, or this science, is an entirely different area of expertise, although they do have uh, certain uh, crossings which are important to recognize. Whenever you're looking at a gunshot wound, can you answer the following questions? And this is what is going to be asked by the investigating officers. Type of weapon used, perhaps. Number and types of projectiles that have uh, gone through the animal. This may be uh, very simple. Uh, on the other hand, I've had other cases where it's been very complex when there's been multiple shootings uh, sometimes even by different guns. The position of the shooter relative to the victim. This might be very important in attack cases where an animal has been killed uh, supposedly attacking somebody and uh, there's a lawsuit involved. Uh, sometimes <clears throat> the lethality and the inc or the ability to incapacitate the animal is very important because typically they will say, oh yeah, that must have been uh, wounded before I, uh, I came across it and so I didn't do it. Uh, and sometimes the duration of the wound is also very important, which uh, sometimes requires uh, histologic examination of the wound for uh, tissue reaction. Okay, and then of course the recovery of the projectile or the trace evidence that comes from a gunshot wound. First thing, one should know at least some basics about what kind of different uh, uh, gun guns or ammunition are out there in, uh, that one must uh, consider. Uh, basically, we have uh, rifles, and these can come in a variety of high-velocity centerfire rifles, which are the typical hunting rifle for big game. And uh, many of the military rifles then are also included in uh, the high velocity center fire type uh, category. Low velocity or uh, things that travel basically under 2,000 foot per second or more likely 1,600 foot per second or below include things like the uh, ever present 22 rimfire uh, bullet. Um, also things like black powder rifles, uh, sometimes a shotgun uh, slugs, all of these are projectiles that travel below 2,000 as opposed to the high velocity which uh, can generate speeds uh, oftentimes uh, above 3,000 uh, foot per second. The velocity makes a tremendous amount of difference in the wound and that's why I even mentioned that. Pistols typically are low velocity. Most of uh, them travel at uh, 800 to 1600 foot per second. And of course, air guns may even be slower, but they are a type of gun which we see fairly frequently in uh, uh, wildlife areas uh, as cause of death in uh, things like hawks and owls, that type of thing. We also have shotguns to consider, and uh, everybody knows shotguns as far as bird shot, but they also need to rec recognize that a shotgun may uh, shoot either buckshot, which are uh, large pellets, or rifled slugs, which are commonly used for big game. And these have their own uh, 
basic wound characteristic. Different types of ammunition. Well, we have semi-jacketed bullets. This is the typical big game hunting bullet. And it involves uh, a structure of bullet which uh, breaks apart mushrooms uh, when it hits a uh, target, such as a, a carcass, as opposed to a fully jacketed bullet, which are the military type bullets, which don't mushroom and, and fragment apart. They're not built to do that anyway. Sometimes they do, but for the most part, they're uh, there to hit, tumble, and proceed through the, uh, the body, uh, causing a, uh, a wound. Certain types of uh, bullets uh, have the characteristic of uh, fully jacketed bullets in that they uh, retain and do not fragment apart. These might be called the Barnes type or solid copper bullets, and they retain 100% of their weight. And therefore, when you look at a, a carcass that's been shot with uh, either a fully jacketed bullet or a Barnes bullet, you don't see the fragmentation in the x-ray that you uh, see with semi-jacketed bullets. And then, of course, there are uh, steel, solid lead bullets and shotgun slugs. And these do not fragment as much as or in the same characteristics as a semi-jacketed bullet, which is built to blow apart when it hits a target. And then we have uh, different types of shot used in uh, waterfowl or other uh, animals, uh, which can also have its own characteristic which is uh, oftentimes quite visible on x-ray uh, in determining differences in uh, how they uh, deform or uh, don't deform in the case of steel shot uh, when they hit bone or other uh, hard fragments or hard areas within the carcass. Basically, uh, one should recognize that when a high velocity bullet uh, is shot into a gel block which is used to simulate a, uh, a body, uh, we see a profile that uh, demonstrates what's called the temporary wound cavity and also then a solid or a, uh, a permanent wound cavity. Now the temporary wound cavity is that area of tissue tearing and ripping that occurs when instantaneously almost as the bullet hits and travels through flesh. It expands the uh, area around the bullet track ripping and tearing uh, tissue and the temporary wound track may look different in liver which is a capsulated firm type of uh, tissue versus lung which has a high degree of elasticity so you do get differences due to that but if you shoot it into a homogeneous solid block of gel uh, this is somewhat what you get a uh, fragmentation which if you uh, look at the block, you can see uh, uh, usually as the bullet starts to slow down on the uh, left-hand side of the screen, uh, it leaves a track, but where it enters on the right-hand side of the screen, there is an exploded area uh, within the gel, which, if you look at it on the side, looks like this. Uh, you can see it has opened up and then closed back down around a central core of uh, mashed, uh, destroyed tissue. Fragments of the bullet, when it hit, also may go out into the tissue uh, following these uh, uh, expanded tracks and be deposited in a uh, typical pattern uh, out in the tissue. If you have a slow-moving, large type of uh, projectile go through a carcass, it may leave a uh, fairly large but still a uh, more or less distinct tunnel through compared to the high velocity uh, wound profile through a body which uh, rips and tears in a much larger uh, pattern around uh, the uh, wound path. Uh, by looking at these x-ray, taking an x-ray one can uh, see quite vividly the difference between something like a shotgun slug and a high-powered rifle uh, wound track. The trajectory gives the direction of the pro uh, projectile relative to the shooter. Um, I've used this uh, particularly in self-defense uh, cases, and I have a, an example that I'll show you. Uh, 
uh, but it's also been used to find bullets in the field uh, by being able to uh, uh, have the field investigator uh, track back where the animal was shot and there may be hair or tissue uh, evidence to show that that by supplying uh, trajectory one can kind of triangulate back and sometimes find the cartridge sometimes find the bullet out in the environment which otherwise uh, is a big place to search for a uh, tiny piece of uh, metal that's a spent bullet for instance this one's rather obvious uh, this was a case of a grizzly bear charging a man and uh, uh, <coughs> the verification that yes indeed uh, this bear kept coming after he shot was uh, essential to proving that, yeah, he did indeed uh, fire at self-defense. On the other hand, this is a uh, case where I had a wolf come in <coughs> with a large, uh, not a large, but a, a, a wound in the front of the neck. And uh, the claim was, is yes, this wolf was attacking me, and uh, I pulled out my... Uh, 22 and I shot it through the neck and it dropped in front of me as it was charging me. Well, the officer didn't quite believe that even though there was a rather nice wound in the neck in the front uh, anterior aspect of the neck which uh, when the carcass was sent in to me I examined it and realized that this has not got the characteristics of an entrance wound but is more characteristic of a exit wound and uh, the entrance wound when I looked uh, was obvious towards the back of the neck and uh, <clears throat> with an x-ray I also demonstrated that as the bullet passes through the cervical vertebrae indeed the bullet fragments which are dislodged from the bullet by the presence of the vertebrae uh, going through the, the bone uh, were on the ventral surface or the anterior surface of the chest and therefore the bullet direction was clearly visible as going from the back to the front and uh, when approached with this information and analysis of course the guy says well yeah it was running away and uh, I shot at it just because I wanted to kill it so <clears throat> the uh, bullet trajectory starting with the entrance wound going to the exit wound has certain characteristics so what do we look for um, typically an entrance wound is a round or oblong uh, defect in the skin. It may uh, also have what's called an abrasion ring. As the bullet passes through the skin tissue it may leave a rather nice abrasion ring. Um, as the bullet proceeds further into the body maybe it hits a, uh, a piece of bone and the shelving of the bone will give a direction in that the entrance part of it will be uh, quite a bit different as depicted in this picture this will be these will have smooth or should I say non shelved uh, exit as we can see around the uh, periphery of this the breaking out of the piece is quite characteristic of the direction and finally the exit wound exit wounds tend to be uh, larger than entrance wounds because the bullet may have mushroomed and is larger it may be also spinning or tumbling and uh, hit the other side uh, skin uh, exiting uh, the back of the bullet uh, or sideways or whatever and the the skin is actually kind of torn out and becomes the edges of the wound become irregular and uh, torn and are, are, you don't see the nice um, typical abrasion ring in an exit wound <clears throat> so the bullet direction goes uh, from the entrance on through the bones and out uh, the exit Radiographically, we can also uh, somewhat determine, uh, in a lot of cases, the direction of the bullet. Um, typically, a bullet entrance wound uh, has much less uh, fragmentation than as the bullet travels through the carcass and hits various uh, other parts of it, particularly bone, uh, 
it will then fragment and the predominance of the fragmentation will be uh, on the other side. Uh, even skin as it goes through the skin and, and, and all you have to examine is a, a piece of skin with an entrance wound uh, versus an exit wound. The uh, x-ray will show particulate matter in the exit side but not necessarily the entrance side. Here is a, a case of a typical snowstorm effect of a high velocity bullet uh, as the bullet proceeds through the uh, body of a wolf. And again, uh, the wound track is demonstrable by where uh, the larger fragments are as the bullet slows down and uh, breaks apart. The location of the projectile, uh, x-rays are essential for determining where these are and what larger pieces might be available. Uh, one can spend a great deal of time trying to uh, sort through uh, working through tissue uh, without the guidance of an x-ray. I typically take wound tissue, lay it out on a, uh, a plate when I'm uh, at that point and looking for small fragments of the jacket uh, and locate it uh, using an x-ray and marking the uh, location before I start going in and isolating uh, individual pieces of the of a bullet fragment. A larger bullet is a lot easier to find if it's intact, uh, but typically uh, even uh, bullets that fragment badly like this, they may have a piece of usable bullet jacket which can be matched back to the uh, perpetrator's gun. One must also be uh, cognizant of the fact that bullets break apart and that the jacket, which is a thinner copper material uh, as opposed to the lead core, uh, will give a different uh, x-ray profile. As we can see in this case, there appears to be uh, perhaps uh, four bullets. In reality, there are only two, but the jacket has been dislodged from the bullet, leaving the core, which is the darker part, and the lighter portion up here in the corner is the jacket. It's the jacket that's important to the firearms examiner and that is what you're really looking to preserve and uh, document and retrieve. Sometimes we have an obvious entrance wound and an obvious exit wound, but if we look at that animal with an x-ray, we don't see any fragmentation. And that's a good indication that such that this animal has been shot with a bullet such as a Barnes bullet, which is, uh, while it mushrooms nicely and makes a big hole uh, on the exit, it does not leave any particles because it's 100% retained uh, due to its copper, solid copper composition. So that's a clue in itself when one is looking uh, at these. Here is a uh, difference between lead shot and steel shot. I do a lot of these because, as you may well know, lead shot uh, causes uh, poisoning in waterfowl uh, when ingested. And uh, because this is a, a rather uh, widespread problem, the uh, prohibition of traditional lead shot in waterfowl hunting and in uh, areas of wetlands has uh, been legislated against and has been replaced with steel shot. So people that go ahead and still try to use lead shot uh, are definite uh, interest to the law enforcement people. And uh, so determining whether or not a bird was shot with steel shot versus lead shot becomes one of my major areas of concern. Now steel shot is obvious on this x-ray and it is nice and round. They do not deform versus lead shot which fragments. But really the key here for the pathologist to remember is which shot caused the animal to be taken. That is it no longer could fly and or was killed. Uh, many waterfowl do still have uh, shot present in their body but it's up to the uh, forensic examiner to determine if the uh, lead shot was instrumental in bringing the animal down. Uh, typically, uh, 
uh, all the different cases that I've had to testify in, they always claim that, oh yeah, the guy down the lake shot it with lead shot. I always use steel. And the defense to that, uh, uh, against that is, is, well, that's fine if they can fly from point A to point B down the lake with only one wing, because the wing has been shattered with a lead shot, uh, great. But most juries don't believe that. Again, we go back to the structure of a bullet. Uh, a bullet travels through a barrel. A barrel leaves uh, certain types of marks on the bullet jacket, which uh, can be matched back to an individual firearm. Just measuring what's called lands and grooves caused by the rifling in the bullet may even give you uh, a particular type of weapon or a grouping of weapons that use that particular uh, type of rifling or that particular measurement. For instance, the, uh, the rifling down a bullet may be a right turn, it may be a left turn, there may be nine grooves, there may be four grooves, there may be twelve grooves, the grooves may be x millimeters wide, uh, that type of thing. All of that's used by the firearms examiner to narrow down what possible weapons are uh, out there that caused the bullet wound and uh, therefore uh, what rifles to perhaps look for in a search warrant of a suspect. Now handling these bullets in a, in a gunshot uh, case is important. One of the things that is a big no-no is you do not handle this with any kind of metallic uh, such as a forceps, that type of thing. Uh, because that scratches those delicate uh, uh, striations on a bullet, which the uh, firearms examiner gets very perturbed about. The other thing is, is we take a bullet out, or bullet fragments, we wash them in fresh water as best we can, and we do not put them in any kind of plastic, because the plastic will further corrode uh, with the moisture retention. Uh, it's best to take uh, bullet fragments, place them in gauze, and place them in a, uh, an envelope, a paper envelope, uh, which uh, prevents them from uh, becoming moist and uh, uh, corroding. The corrosion, of course, then would uh, oftentimes uh, uh, obscure the fine detail of what the firearms examiner is looking for. When we look for a wound, look at a gunshot wound, we want to know whether or not this wound would have stopped the animal immediately or been immediately fatal uh, because typically uh, what we find in a court case is, is they will say, well, I didn't shoot this. Somebody else must have shot it. And this is very true in most of these archery cases where they have taken uh, an arrow and uh, or they've, they've killed the animal with a gun and uh, placed an arrow in the wound and claimed it as an archery kill uh, for big game. And they will typically claim that, oh yeah, somebody must have shot it over the hill and it wandered over here and I shot it with my arrow. So recognizing that, did this animal, uh, how far do you think it could go? And this can be a very subjective type of thing. Uh, could he describe, with the wounds you've described uh, doctor, could this animal have traveled a half a mile? Could it have traveled uh, 50 yards? Whatever is the typical defense attorney's uh, questioning line. And getting you to commit to that is uh, a real cat and mouse game. So unless you have a nice wound through the spinal cord that would have dropped an animal uh, uh, very quickly uh, due to severance of the spinal cord, or a, uh, even a heart wound, uh, heart, an, an elk can go quite a ways uh, with half its heart blown apart. Uh, maybe not a mile, but uh, several hundred yards before he would collapse. And so you have that kind of parameter to work with uh, in some of these cases. How far can a dog go with its heart blown out as it's, an, uh, as it's attacking? Well, that, that could be very interesting in a uh, uh, situation uh, in a court. Also, any evidence of healing or inflammation and contamination of the wound tissue. If there is a doubt, histopathology uh, might be helpful. Uh, 
uh, knowing the sequence of uh, healing and how fast uh, uh, tissue reaction might occur uh, relative to the uh, anticipated uh, duration. This case is uh, one that's bugged me for three years now. I've been to court three times. Uh, this is an example of <coughs> one of these cases that uh, was a archery case, yet it had two bullet wounds through the neck. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the whole animal to look at. I didn't even have the neck, uh, that is the uh, vertebrae and the uh, uh, tissues of the neck. I only had the cape, which is the skin of the head and neck, to deal with. Well, I could prove very conclusively that, yes, I had two gunshot wounds, one entering, or two of them entering on one side, one exiting uh, through the uh, area. And uh, there was testimony by the butcher that said, yes, he found a, uh, a uh, bullet uh, in the neck and the, the uh, cervical vertebrae were fractured. Um, so that was ancillary testimony. Unfortunately, the butcher did not save the neck and the vertebrae uh, for examination. So this case has gone on um, three trials. Uh, twice the guy, uh, the jury found uh, that the testimony was uh, uh, favorable for a guilty verdict and once was a hung jury and it's currently uh, I guess being appealed by the Montana uh, Supreme Court or to the Montana S Supreme Court and uh, this is a very interesting case because it involves not only uh, uh, examination of this but a, a whole history of other other problems um, with the uh, with the individual anyway we see these arrow gunshot wounds fairly frequently and a diagnostician may be asked in uh, a diagnostic lab to, to uh, certify whether or not this uh, deer has been shot with an arrow versus a, uh, a gun. And arrow wounds, they have their own characteristics. Remember that an arrow is a very sharp cutting object and is meant to cause hemorrhage. It does not tear and rip tissue uh, as does a, uh, a high velocity bullet and therefore you would expect to get uh, hemorrhage uh, around the border of the uh, incision. You may get a very nice cutting of hairs as an arrow slaps into a uh, animal. Uh, the hair is cut evenly and quickly versus an arrow that's just shoved into an animal that uh, doesn't cut it nice and clean and quick like a arrow shot from a bow and uh, arrows will penetrate bone and the fragmentation of the bone is entirely different as it relates to uh, the prying apart and fragment fragmenting along nice cleavage lines in an arrow. Uh, in a gunshot wound typically the bone will uh, fragment into small granular pieces. And the next area of uh, forensic importance are trauma wounds, which we may see as uh, caused by a number of different uh, entities. Uh, we talk about patterned in injury in a lot of cases where a series of wounds or trauma type lesions may give a uh, story uh, to the animal. Uh, we talk about blunt trauma injury, sharp trauma injury, and oftentimes we have kind of both uh, balled up into what uh, predators may do to uh, animals. And these are a lot of times either differential uh, type uh, determinations or they may uh, be for uh, uh, compensation uh, for what predators have uh, done in livestock uh, situations. Patterned injury, here's a uh, example of a series of, of injuries which uh, give a pattern. A uh, case I testified in concerning a cougar which was uh, illegally taken uh, from a national park area in a uh, rather bizarre uh, case where a hunter was guaranteed a cougar or no pay uh, 
to the guide service. Well, the guide service had a good thing going. They felt that they could go up, chase down a cougar, rope it, bring it down the mountain, uh, and then release it in front of the uh, hunter, and he would be assured to get his uh, uh, cougar trophy, and they would be assured to get paid. So uh, the informant uh, described the situation and uh, finally the arrest was made and the material that came in for examination included of course the the cougar pelt which uh, obviously had gunshot wounds in it which was really not the uh, the question being asked but it did have uh, rope abrasions or abrasions uh, across the uh, cheek and neck uh, which may have been uh, typical of a, a rope through the mouth it also had claws that were broken and tattered and torn. Uh, obviously, this animal had been fighting against something and uh, as he was being uh, pulled down the rocks. Um, he had a typical uh, choking type pathologic uh, uh, hemorrhage around the larynx, uh, which is seen in choke victims uh, in human cases of strangulation. Uh, so this hemorrhage was uh, in between the uh, cartilages, so it indicated that he had been uh, strangled uh, badly. He also had within his stomach content, interestingly enough, uh, some rather uh, interesting uh, fragments of, uh, of uh, polypropylene rope, which uh, interestingly matched polypropylene rope found uh, in the back of the pickup of the uh, of the person uh, that was responsible, so they claimed, of course, oh yes, we we did uh, drag the uh, carcass around with this rope as we uh, packed him out when we uh, killed him. But uh, then, when asked to explain how the rope fibers would have been swallowed by a dead cougar, I think the jury finally figured out that somebody. Uh, was uh, not quite telling the truth there. So that was a series of patterned injuries that led to a story which was uh, confirmed by the presence of the uh, fibers or trace evidence in the stomach and led to a conviction. So these types of things are uh, fairly uh, common in that there are a lot of other ways that animals may be killed which require uh, some interesting uh, evaluation. In this case, this was a wolf, which uh, I'm not sure what the claim of how it died, but when it was sent in, it had uh, broken and bent hairs around the neck. If we went down into the uh, cutaneous uh, tissues, we saw a uh, definite crease, which when we look down into the further tissues, we see a, a light-colored uh, area of, uh, of uh, tissue uh, bordered by uh, very congested tissue, and this is typical of a, a strangulation with a rope type of uh, lesion, and of course the rope would fit around a nice groove around the neck. So this was a case of a, uh, a wolf caught in what's called a snare around the neck and choked to death. Um, it is an illegal methodology and uh, the individual was convicted. Sharp force injuries are those which may uh, be made by knives, uh, axes, or arrows. And obviously these are <coughs> incisions versus uh, more of a trauma or blunt force where you have bruising, uh, tissue bridging, uh, you may have uh, bone fractures associated with, but in sharp force injury, typically a knife wound will have uh, edges that are uh, reflect the uh, sharp edge of the knife. In this particular case, uh, this was a commercial operation that illegally netted catfish, and uh, this was. Uh, supposed to have been passed off as a hook injury. Well, a hook injury, uh, an animal twisting on a uh, sharp hook, uh, 
it's going to cause ripping and tearing versus a uh, rather uh, nice, easy uh, to identify incision uh, scalpel may like you would make with a scalpel. So while the uh, field officer uh, was suspicious of this, when he brought it in, you could obviously see that there was also stab wound to the roof of the mouth of this fish, and uh, the fellow used his pocket knife to simulate uh, a hook injury so that he could pass these off as legally caught uh, fish. But in reality, they, they had been net caught in a commercial fishery and uh, were being sold on the uh, underground market. So we had another case which was interesting, an ax wound. In an ax, you would expect to have a rather sharp edge type of uh, injury. Um, instead, uh, this, this involved a sturgeon, a group of sturgeon, uh, which were four or five feet long sturgeon, very interesting uh, animals. But uh, each one of them had at the same spot in their head a rather uh, large uh, broken area in the skull. And to the uninitiated, this may look like a large blunt type of uh, sharp edge, uh, such as an ax that would have been uh, used to hit the animal in the head. But in reality, if we look at it closely, we can see it's not very straight. It's a broken along a plane which has uh, a significant amount of uh, <coughs> jagging uh, within the bone fragments and this would not be characteristic of an axe wound. The other part of this is, is that it was broken from forces below as evidenced by shelving uh, of the bone plates and uh, coupled with a little information that said yeah there's a dam upstream when I ask him, did these things somehow uh, go over something high? Because I found abrasions on the nose. Why well, the officer said, yes, there's a dam a couple miles upstream. And of course, the story then goes is, yeah, these sturgeon, which are normally bottom fish, uh, somehow decided to migrate downstream. And instead of uh, going around the dam on the fish ladder, they went over the dam, which was about 25 feet high landed on their snout and the torquing of the snout uh, actually broke uh, the, uh, the skull bones and gave a axe-like lesion. So this is really not an example of a sharp force injury but a differential diagnosis for uh, another uh, explanation of what happened. Vehicular injuries, of course, are very common in uh, domestic animals, for particularly small animals. And when we start looking at uh, vehicular injuries, uh, of course, in a wildlife area, one always suspects that somebody has dastardly uh, done the deed of killing, uh, uh, particularly wolves. This wolf came in with what appeared to be a gunshot wound in the back. Uh, there was clearly a uh, rather nice hole in the skin, which on examination was not typical of a gunshot bullet wound uh, because it did not have the characteristics of smooth surface uh, abrasion ring and that type of thing. And of course, uh, when we got down into looking at the whole animal, we see that there is a massive uh, uh, contusions of the uh, tissues and uh, finally contusions and lacerations of the liver and uh, internal hemorrhage, which is you know pretty typical of a very strong blunt force injury caused by a vehicle. So uh, the animal was not gunshot as originally suspected because of the holes in the skin, but indeed uh, were uh, hit by a vehicle. And of course, asking the uh, individual, well, how far was the uh, uh, wolf found from a uh, road uh, would have helped uh, had that been included in the history and when I asked at finding uh, the uh, uh, lesions that I did why yeah it had traveled uh, probably about a mile with that particular uh, amount of damage which is not uncommon. So livestock predation is another uh, area that the veterinary pathologist may have to deal with in trying to determine whether
uh, forensic cases uh, involve uh, uh, the uh, killing of livestock maliciously or by wildlife. Since the introduction of the wolf in Idaho and in the Yellowstone ecosystem, there's been a great deal of controversy over this. And uh, I have uh, been involved in a number of cases involving livestock uh, predation by the wolf. Um, this was one case which uh, shows kind of a very interesting pattern. Uh, a calf was sent in to me along with a wolf that had been shot while standing over the calf. Examination of the calf revealed that it was a newborn calf. The uh, hooves were uh, very soft and very uh, unabraded and the uh, meconium was still present. The lungs were only partially inflated and the um, uh, colostrum was uh, not present uh, in the stomach. So those are the things that I recognized as being a newborn calf which if I believed uh, the field investigation by a uh, local veterinarian and the news media uh, from the uh, state of Idaho, um, which claimed uh, irrefutable evidence that the calf was killed by a wolf, uh, I would have maybe stopped right there. But if you notice, there is no area of, of really hemorrhage I found no areas of broken bones within the calf and the neck, which is typical of, a, of the uh, wolf kill. And uh, although the wolf had eaten portion of the, uh, uh, the skin and the guts and did indeed have a portion of this calf in its stomach, uh, the question really was, is, was the calf killed by the wolf? And the answer to that in pathologic terms was there is no evidence that the animal was actually killed. But indeed, this, there is evidence that this calf was a stillborn. And uh, that uh, was my pronouncement that, yes, the, the wolf did eat the calf because the pieces found in the lower picture on the right-hand side were actually taken from the wolf's stomach. But if you notice, there is no uh, hemorrhage around that particular area where those were taken out of. There's no hemorrhage on the carcass. There's no hemorrhage on the skin, which would indicate blunt trauma from and tearing from the wolf. This case actually went all the way to congressional hearings, believe it or not, because of the controversy uh, with the Idaho wolf. And uh, I was able to document very clearly um, that the calf uh, had no signs of an acute uh, death. And as it turns out, the transportation of the calf from where it was born, some 400 yards to where it was found, uh, was blamed on the wolf, whereas this was a 60-pound calf and a 100-pound wolf, and there's no drag marks in the snow. So that was another clue as to, yes, this calf was moved by something other than the wolf. And then finally, in the actual presentation of films of the original examination of the crime scene, uh, indeed, uh, the calf was stiffer than the board. The wolf was not, indicating that there was a significant amount of difference between the time of death of the calf and the time of death of the wolf. Under the wolf, there was no snow melting. Or under the calf, there was no snow melting under the wolf the snow had melted because of the warm body temperature. So all of these things in a crime scene add up to uh, a conclusion which uh, can stand uh, firm on. Here is an example of what a wolf will do to a sheep or a calf. Uh, typically, the hemorrhage is uh, quite extensive, and it will extend fairly deep into the musculature. And oftentimes what you will have is a penetration of the uh, neck or spinal column. Sometimes you will also have extensive ripping of the intestines and uh, that type of thing, all indicating that the animal was alive and had the capability to bleed while it was being attacked by a predator. So here was another case which was claimed to be a gunshot 
And uh, again, looking at it, x-raying it, what did I find? Well, I find a nice piercing wound to the neck. And again, examining that, uh, we find that that fit very nicely with a bite wound of a cougar to the neck of the wolf. There was obviously no bullet fragments or no indication that a bullet was uh, uh, present in this animal. Another case where differentiation was important from predator wounds was the case of the mutilated turtles. There was a rather large case, a uh, lot of news media, that turtles in the Gulf of Mexico were being hacked to death by shrimpers when they caught them in the net. And uh, these were sent in. And uh, what I found was is pretty good evidence that all of the dismembered or mutilated turtles had multiple cuts and slices as uh, one would expect with uh, multiple pointed shark teeth that stripped off uh, the flesh. So examining these things uh, very closely for the type of incised wound, the pattern of incised wound became uh, very important. Uh, one of the other areas that we deal a lot with is electrical contact. Electrical contact from birds uh, causes uh, a, a tremendous loss in, in eagles and uh, hawks throughout the country. And uh, these are now becoming legal cases for uh, electrical companies to be forced into uh, doing additional work on uh, preventing uh, eagle uh, mortality and uh, by modification of the uh, poles and the wires. Typically, burn victims have uh, very nicely curled, almost uh, plastic-like burns uh, on the filaments of the feathers, and uh, they uh, are quite distinctive. Okay, the next area of forensics importance uh, to the veterinary uh, pathologist is the area of poisoning of animals. Uh, poisoned animals uh, constitute at least a third to a half of all the uh, animals that we examine. And uh, many times these are intentional poisonings of protected wildlife in, uh, that I examine. This is very widespread throughout the United States because of the availability of very toxic poisons, you know, particularly those in the carbamate and organophosphate uh, class, which are used for agricultural pesticides. There is actually an illegal market for uh, uh, restricted-use uh, pesticides that uh, farmers, if they uh, desire, can uh, get these materials uh, for use in poisoning animals. Many, of the, many times uh, dogs in an area are also poisoned in relation to uh, efforts to uh, poison predators or other wildlife in uh, the environment. So what do we look for when we start looking at poisoning uh, cases? And what are the objectives? Well, for one, we want to, of course, identify the poison and uh, demonstrate that, yes, this is a uh, uh, animal, this was the cause of death of the animal. The source of the poison is very important. Therefore, identification of such materials that are in the stomach that would clue us back to what this animal ate to get uh, uh, the, the poison is important. So things like hair or tissue samples in fresh cases uh, that uh, come from the stomach content are identified. So we also may want to know whether it was killed with inge by ingested poison which includes uh, water source or water-based, because oftentimes animals do not have material in the stomach that are poisoned, or is it a contact poison? Many of these organophosphate carbamate pesticides are absorbable in the skin, through the skin, and do cause uh, uh, their effect uh, directly uh, on the cholinesterase systems through that mechanism. And determine, if we can, whether this is a primary or secondary target uh, based on the uh, uh, poisoning, uh, the material which is in the, in the stomach. Can we identify if it's, if it's uh, been intentionally uh, baited or whether or not perhaps this animal got something else that was the target of the poison and uh, 
was legally poisoned, such as a, a rat. We, we see a lot of, of uh, animals that have consumed secondarily either pest birds or rodents uh, that come through as suspected poisoning. These are usually accidental or uh, non-targeted situations. Make sure, of course, that the analytical chemistry uses uh, established methods. We kind of covered that in that first area of uh, talking about certified labs, certified protocols, and that type of thing. And so the analytical uh, chemistry, we also might want to make sure that uh, split samples, because the defense does have a right in these cases to additional uh, materials uh, for their analysis. So uh, split samples, again, uh, pre present them and handle them as evidence, as you would the original sample. Toxicology, uh, we uh, have tried to use blood and brain cholinesterase also for determining that uh, the animal was indeed physiologically affected uh, by the uh, OP or carbamate pesticides along with identification of a specific uh, car, uh, pesticide from the uh, gut contents. Again, we're dealing with uh, subsamples and uh, chain of custody and secure storage protocols are appropriate. Documenting the exposure route, the sequence of, of ingestion is the pathologist's uh, duty to kind of lay that out and uh, that will help trace back where we, uh, where the animal picked up the poison. In this case here, we had uh, crop contents from a goose, uh, which uh, have grass, which is diazinone treated, and that led us back to a golf course type application of diazinone, as opposed to trying to blame it on somebody putting out grain or some other material. Sometimes what we do is individualize all the different contents and then compare and see which of the different content has uh, higher levels of the, of the uh, toxic material. So here was an interesting case, which was my first poisoning case. It involved a wolf, which we did have uh, meat present in the stomach. That meat uh, was similar uh, in genetic composition as uh, shown by our geneticist to baits which are out in the environment which uh, contain cyanide uh, crystals in capsules that were put into the baits. The ID of the uh, uh, capsule uh, in the tissues, that is cyanide in the tissues of the wolf and the presence of identified meat which was traced back to the suspect's freezer. It was his deer that he had uh, taken uh, during that season and had uh, chopped it up and had all the freezer full of the same deer. He had placed those uh, out in the uh, environment for the uh, wolf because he hated wol wolves. This is a uh, idea of the various types of, of uh, material out there that's present for uh, poisoning animals and we see Uh, that in eagles that we have examined, we see a fairly large percent of pentobarbital that comes from veterinary uh, sources. We see some fenthion, famfur, Alde famfur, by the way, is warbex. It's used extensively for uh, control of warbles uh, on cattle and is available throughout the uh, agricultural industry as a non-restricted use pesticide. We see aldicarb and we see mostly or a larger percent of carbofuran than anything else. And finally, we do have uh, a number of cases where we know that they have been poisoned with an organophosphate but, or carbamate but have been unidentified that particular um, type. Um, at this point, I believe I will uh, uh, conclude the uh, presentation and uh, hope that this has been helpful to uh, the uh, veterinary 